Good evening or good afternoon, everyone, depending on your timeline. You are welcome to this program. We thank God for the opportunity he has given to us to be able to meet. We pray that his presence will be with us. And at the end of this program, we will have learned something that will help strengthen us as we walk this journey, this Christian journey. We are so pleased to have all of you online. The reason for this program is that um, somewhere in February, February 1st to 4th, the Ministerial Association had a retreat at Guinea-Bissau. And during the interaction, the Shepherdess group there requested that we should have a talk on mental health because there are lots of people who are going through a lot of things. They are struggling a lot with so many challenges. So if we could run a, a program on mental health, it will help us to solve these problems that others are going through. And so by the grace of God, we have been able to get our lady, Dr. Mrs. Mabel Oti Bwedi. She's a child of God, a Seventh-day Adventist. She's a clinical psychologist and a senior lecturer at the University of Ghana, Lagos. And this evening, she will be seeing us through um, the, the, the program. She is a fellow with the Fox International Fellowship at Yale University and the Pan-African Gender Integration Platform on the Gender Malaria Policy and Advocacy Project Center for Gender Studies and Advocacy. She is also an affiliate with the Center for Gender Studies and Advocacy and the Center for Aging Studies, University of Ghana. Dr. Otibwedi's research primarily focuses on the impact of parenting and family dynamics on the well-being of individuals, regardless of age and ability. She has published in PEP, reviewed uh, journals in the areas of dynamics of parenting children with developmental disabilities and uh, adolescent mental health. Dr. Mabel Lotibwedi is a philanthropist and has a passion to promote the welfare and mental health of vulnerable groups in the Ghanaian society. Dr. Tibwedi is also a licensed clinical psychologist who works with individuals, couples, and families on a variety of issues towards mental development. She is the immediate past national treasurer of the Ghana Psychological Association and the current national treasurer, treasurer for the Ghana Association for Suicide Prevention. And so this evening, Dr. Gwedi will take us through um, these lessons. And to aid her in helping our, brother, our brothers and sisters who don't flow in the English language, uh, Dr. Larissa, uh, who is a medical doctor, Ricardo, who is a professional translator, they will translate the Portuguese language. We also have Gabriel Ingi. He's a medical doctor in training. She's a student medical doctor. She will translate in French. For the Spanish, we have Domingo Idin. He's a Spanish teacher at Babcock University, an experienced English and Spanish translator. And then we also have Leopoldo Ndok. He's also a teacher. So all these people will aid doctor in translating. So those of us who are not fluent in the English language will also benefit. From what we also have our ministerial secretary, Pastor Dr. Kwame Wachikwini with us. He is the ministerial secretary for what? 
The communication director, Elder Bakari, is also online. And Watara is a webmaster for what? He is also online and in charge of the host. Our health director is also online, Dr. Paul Treme. And we thank all of you for joining. We are very, very happy to also inform you that our mother from the general conference is also online. Our mom, Mrs. Aurora Canals, is the Ministerial Spouses Coordinator Director for General Conference. She is also online and she will be giving us a 10 minute devotion before we start the program. So before we begin the program, we are going to have a short prayer that will be offered by our sister and mother, Mrs. Jane Warungwa. Jane, please offer the opening prayer for us to start. Okay, please, shall we pray? I hope I'm audible. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, let's pray. Our merciful and kind Father in heaven, we are grateful unto you for the gift of life today. We thank you, Lord, that this program that has been scheduled for some time, that by your grace, it is a reality today. We thank you for our shepherdesses, all that have joined and those that will still join. We thank you, Lord, for our mom from the GC. We thank you, O Lord, for all our coordinators. Mm -hmm. We thank you for this all-important topic that we are going to discuss tonight. Father, King of glory, may your Holy Spirit interpret it more to us. Help us to understand it. Help us to be able to put it into practice in our life, in our ministries, that at the end, your name and your name alone will be glorified. Thank you, Lord, because you do for us more than we can ever think or imagine or even ask. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So Amen. we are we want to be um, we want to thank the coordinators from all the fields. Thank you so much for sending this message out and encouraging our ladies to join the platform. So the next voice we hear is our mom's voice, Mrs. Aurora Canals. She'll give us a devotion. Good evening or good afternoon. Uh, it's afternoon over here where I'm at. So the devotion of this morning, I title it, title it, uh, Do Not Grow Weary. Today we seek to see the wisdom of the verse from, uh, from the Apostle Paul in Galatians 6, 9. So if you want to open your Bible, Galatians 6, 9, um, it tells us in there, he encourages us with this word. And let us not grow weary while doing good. For in due season, we shall reap if we do not lose far. Now, I have another Bible here that it says, we must continue to do things that are good and we should not get tired. If we do not feel weak and stop doing good things, then we will receive a good harvest at the proper time. So when we, when we get tired, when we get worried, uh, it is hard to stay focused. And I have experienced that in my devotional life. Our bodies are considered temple of the Holy Spirit. And God has given us, he has entrusted us the responsibility of being a good store and caring for our health. Maintaining physical health is not a selfish act, but a form of worshiping God. When we nurture our bodies, we honor God. It enhances our ability to carry out his work effectively. When we are sick, we can't do the, our, his work effectively. So we have to honor God. In order to honor God, we have to stay healthy. By staying healthy, we set an example for others and show the good desire as a good store in our physical well-being. In our church, 
journey to maintain physical healthy bodies while serving the Lord, there are seven essential practices that we should embrace to avoid growing worry. Number one, communication with God. Dedicate time every day for prayer and study the Bible. That is our first priority. Engaging in regular communication with God is strengthened our spiritual and mental well-being, which in turn contribute, contribute to physical healthy bodies. Number two, prayer and meditation, taking time, taking that moment first thing in the morning to pray and meditate on the word of God. This practice not only deepens our spiritual connection, but it also helps us to reduce stress to promoting overall health. Now, this one I enjoy every single day is number three, physical activity. I like to walk. I like to run. I like to do that every single day. My, my goal on a daily basis is 20,000 steps per day. And I enjoy doing that because it helps me. And so that is something that we need to do. And God instructed us to do at, at a regular base. Um, I do it seven days of the week. I like to stay myself physical. Not only did I do it while I'm walking and running, I can listen to the Bible. I can listen. I put my little earbuds in my ears and I'm listening to the Bible. I can listen to music. All of that help us reduce stress and stay our mind sharp. Now, number four, adequate rest. Ensure that you get seven to eight hours of restful sleep each night. So it's good to go to bed early. If you're working late, try not to work late every single night. Try to take the time so that you rest seven to eight hours at, at every, each night. Sleeping is essential for healing and maintaining a healthy body and it helps our immune system. Now, I'm practicing another one that I, I just did it today and it's when I do my physical activity in order to get uh, circulation in my body and stay myself focused and not being stressful is taking a cold shower. I don't know if you like it. I don't like cold showers but, uh, but I'm taking it because it helps blood circulation in my body and it helps me Stay focused. It reduces stress. It helps you sleep better. Now, number five is balanced diet. We need to eat healthy, rich nutrition diet for our body so that we can stay healthy. That is something that that is the the way to keep our body optimal. So we just need to just look for recipes that are healthy vegetarian is good some people are going gluten free all of that what we put in our body is what is going to help us stay healthy and stay mentally healthy and physically healthy now there is another one six a stress management we need to minimize our stress try to uh and i i'm speaking to myself try to be on time so that if you're driving from your home to work, you're not stressed. So it's better just to manage our time in a way that it doesn't create a stress in ourselves. And that affects our heart, it affects our mood, it affects our way of thinking. So yes, managing the stress is a good thing to do. And then number seven, listen to your body. We need to listen to our, our body when our bodies are telling us we're tired, that we need to maybe take a rest, that we need to get up and, and stand and, and, and maybe we can work while standing or maybe go for a walk, go up the stairs, 
I enjoy at the general conference just going up the stairs seven or eight times. That is good for me. I feel healthy. I feel good when my heart is, is you know, I give it a, a workout. So all of that helps our brain, help our mental health. And I and I understand what is mental health. I when I was out of my when I had my little ones at a younger age, I went to depression. I went with medication, and that is my personal thing. I did not want to do that. I did not want to take medication. So what exactly did I did? I said no. I am not taking medication. I am going to go for a run, and that's how I did it. I went for a run, my medication, I was able to put my medication aside and I was able to feel better, not feel depressed, not feel moody. And I was able to take care of my little ones. So if you're feeling down, yes, you need to talk to your doctor. That is one thing that we need to do. You need to listen to your body, but you also need to bring that to your doctor and talk it over with your doctor. Don't quit medication without talking it with your doctor. But your main doctor is the one that is up there. We need to communicate with him. He is the one who created us, and he is the one who knows our body. So we need to bring all our needs to him. And I was, the other day, I was going through some struggle. And I went through this verse, which is found on 1 Peter 5, 7. And it says, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. And I could not fall asleep because my I was just having so much anxiety myself. And I needed to trust in God. So I took that five, seven, and I made it personally. And I said, I repeated it to myself with my name. And I said, Aurora, anxiety and Jesus, because Jesus cares for you. When I did that, and I kept repeating it and repeating it and repeating it, a peace just came into my body. And it felt like God was with me and I was able to fall asleep. So if you're having anxiety, if you're having depression, if you're struggling with your mind, put all of that in Jesus because he is here to listen to all of us. He wants to take care of you. He wants to be with you. All we need to do is just surrender our life to him because he, he gave his life for each one of us and he wants to save us. He wants for us to keep our body healthy. It's only one body we have and we need to be good steward of this body because God wants the best for us. We have a God that loves us and he cares for each one of us. And he wants to pour blessing on us. So all we need to do is just surrender ourselves to him every morning and give ourselves to him on a daily basis. And then keep that thought about God, about Jesus in our life throughout the whole day, because that will give us peace. That will give us a better understanding what we're going he is our God. He wants to have communion with you. All we need to do is have that communication with him. And so I just urge you, I just uh, motivate you, I encourage you your Bible, prayer, meditation, exercise, uh, have a proper rest, and eat eat proper food uh, and just have that communion and give it to the Lord. Every every problem that we might be facing, just give it to him. Surrender yourself to him and God will take care of you. I hope the Lord will bless you and I know he's going to be with you and he's going to be with each one of us as we learn more about 
what we're dealing with mental health. May God bless you and continue uh, in your in your work that you're doing for him. Thank you very much. We are very, very grateful for the message that you have given to us. We are going to use this, this um, passage, apply to ourselves. Keep us in good health to be able to worship him very well. We are going to move on now. And so we want to invite our speaker. Alors, nous allons inviter euh, notre invité. Un... We pray that the Lord will be with her as she takes us through the lesson. Doc, please, over to you. Hello, Doc. Okay, good evening. Good evening, Doc. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you very much for this opportunity to be with you here and to take you through mental health, basically. Uh, depression, anxiety. Uh, there are many of them, but this is what we will do today. I know there are many times we can meet and do more of it. So, um, Mrs. Odonko, I'm grateful to you. I'm grateful to uh, Women's Ministry Director GC. Heard everything she said. And then um, that um, at the end of the day, you all get something beautiful from this uh, presentation, and then we we'll all get better in waiting for Christ's own coming. So, um, I want to get the opportunity to share. Can I get the rights to share, please? All right, thank you. All right, okay. All right, so I'm going to take it on to um, slide show. All right, so um, we are going to go through, I mean, I know there are men on the platform, but um, is my video off? Hello. Hi. We can hear you. Yeah, my my video is off. I don't know. <laughs> we can see we can see you and we can see your what you are sharing okay. to your screen. All right, all right, that's fine. Okay, so I know there are men on the platform, but whatever we are going to discuss this evening would relate to them as well, and we will look at uh, the women's issues more more of that as well. Well, this month in Ghana, May, I mean, last month, has been declared by the Mental Health Authority as the Mental Health Month. And all happens in the other uh, uh, West African countries. But um, this is what we have in Ghana. So this May, I've been doing a lot of talking on mental health, and I'm happy um, our church has also recognized the need to discuss this, bring this to the fore, and then let people know, and then to be able to take care of ourselves very well. So I'll take you through some definitions. I'll take you through some prevalence, some symptoms, risk factors, treatment. Um, somebody's writing on my screen. Okay. And then um, some strategies for health, uh, self-care. Um, Madam has said a lot. I'll add a few, and then um, we'll see where it gets us to. <clears throat> so the World Health Organization defines mental health as a state of mind in which an individual is able to realize his or her own abilities 
cope with the normal stresses of life, can work productively and fruitfully, and is able to make a contribution to his or her community. So that is mental health. If you are able to know what is going on in your life, and if you are able to cope with it, if you are able to work, if you are able to function, like we have a program now, you've been able to log on, you know what is going on, you know what we are going to discuss. All of that constitutes your mental health. You are able to relate with other people well. You are understand what goes on with you and you are able to make contributions to your community. And in this case, your church, that has to do with your mental health. And your ability to maintain a successful mental activity every day and fulfilling relationships with others. That is your mental health. Most of the time, or most of us, don't show much concern about our mental health. We only very much concerned about our physical health. We visit the doctor every other time to check our headache, to check our stomach problems, to check our knee and so on. How many of us like to check if we are good at our mental health? How many of us do that? How many of us talk to a counselor? How many of us talk to a psychologist, discuss our issues? Or talk to a pastor, discuss our issues, what is troubling our minds? We don't do that. But that is the pillar of our lives. What goes on in your brain, how your brain functions, is actually who you are. So if we don't take our mental health, then we cannot function properly. So we all have mental health, like I said, relating to how we think, how we feel, how we behave and interact with other people. So if you find somebody who is in this position, like the gentleman here, how is this gentleman, what do you think is happening to him? I want this to be interactive, so we'll be, what is happening to him? What do you see on the screen? Anybody can come up. A lot of thoughts are going on in his mind. Like you can see that he's down, he's had, he had his head down. What is he thinking? How is he feeling? You know, and then you have this picture too. What do you see here? <laughs> oh, you're muted. Oh, okay. Then let me go on. But I want you to just keep interacting with the, the pictures and see what's going on. That here you see a behavior being exhibited. Somebody shouting into another person's health is very, very important. And it relates to our thinking, our feelings, and our actions. The same way as I said in progress. So collectively, mental illness, which is like bigger aspects of our mental health, refers to all diagnosable mental disorders that cause significant changes in our thinking, changes in our emotions, behaviors, and distress that prevents us from functioning in our social life, work, and our family activities. So Depression and anxiety are the most common mental health disorders globally, with about one in 10 people affected by these at any given time. These mental health disorders are treatable when diagnosed early enough. They are treatable. So there are several of these mental disorders, anxiety, depression, bipolar, personality, schizophrenia, eating disorders, several of them. But we are going to focus on depression and anxiety. Let's look at the prevalence of mental illness. So one in every eight people, these are the WHO statistics. One in every eight people in the world live with a mental health disorder. Or about 
970 million people. And in Ghana, I mean, I mean, with the statistics in Ghana, we have about 2.3 million people living with some form of mental disorder. Just as it happens in all the other countries, mental illness is at the top. Many people experience mental disorders. And most of them, especially those in lower middle income countries like Ghana, countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, West African region, cannot or do not assess treatment that they require. And it's serious. And the loss to productivity is huge. For example, in Ghana, approximately 7% of our GDP is lost to mental illness. If people calling in sick here and there, which has nothing to do with their fiscal conditions. However, there is evidence that the benefits of investing in mental health far outweighs the costs. For example, if you put in one CD, as we have in Ghana, you could reap or you could have productivity increasing to about seven cities, which means that investment in mental health, be it the community, the church, the state is key in ensuring higher levels of productivity. But many people, many people who have mental illness do not want to talk about it because of the stigma associated with mental illness. Because of this, many people do not seek treatment and early intervention surface until a crisis point is reached where probably the person steps out or does something outrageous that people get to know and then have to take the person to the hospital. So mental illness is nothing to be ashamed of because it is no respect of persons. That's all we should all know. It is no respect of race. It is no respect of gender. Anybody can get mental illness. But because of the stigma, because we don't treat people with mental illness well, people like to hide. Their relatives don't want people to know about what is going on. And then they are unable to seek treatment. So I decided to give you some of the mental health stigmas. Something like you shouldn't have kids. You just pass on your issues, so selfish. That's what somebody says. Everyone has anxiety. Some people are just stronger than you are. You trivialize it. All women are a bit of bipolar. Is that how it is? A mental illness is just an excuse to life of benefits and not to contribute to society. These are some of the things we hear people say about mental illness. And when it happens like that, then you are pushing people into the background. They will not come out. And when they don't come out, we are not able to provide treatment, and then it affects everyone. But the key facts about mental health disorders or mental illness is that most people with mental disorders live productive lives whilst they receive treatment. So they are lecturers, they are lawyers, they are doctors who live with mental illness. But once they're on treatment, they are fine and they go about their activities. Like I said, it affects everyone, whether you are rich or you are poor, whether you're a Christian, you're a Muslim, or you're a traditionalist. Mental illness is no respect of persons. It is more than just a stress, more than just responding to issues in the environment. Mental illness is more, more than that. It may be brief or it could be long term. And it affects how you work, how you relate to other people. Some people, when they experience a mental illness, are unable to relate well with other people. They see them, they pass. You wonder what is going on with them. And they don't know that that's what they are doing. For instance, you go for programs like we, we do most of the time as Adventists, and you see that this person is quarreling with everybody at the program. It is not their fault. There is a problem that needs to be attended to. 
So there's no health without mental health. Most of us here on this platform, I know have a family member or a friend who has mental illness. And so it's our responsibility. Mental Everybody illness, you know, it's our responsibility. To take care okay. of our mental health. I want you to have a look at what is on the screen and see some of the common early signs of mental I'm not saying this is what you'll be diagnosed with. I mean, there are, there are several uh, criteria in diagnosing, but these are some of the signs that when you find them, don't just say it's nothing being concerned and talking to someone, someone you trust. So when you have poor motivation, you don't feel like doing anything. You increasingly getting anxious every day. You feel restless. You are highly emotional. In a small thing, it gets triggered. You lack energy. You have problems with sleep. You make statements of self-worthlessness. I don't have anything. I don't mean anything to anybody. I am nothing. When you start saying those things to yourself, poor concentration, you are distracted easily. When you see some of these signs, take action, talk to someone. It may not be something deeper, but something that you could deal with easily than getting it to a crisis point. But what are the risk factors? What are some of the things that could predispose us to mental illness? There are biological factors. There are events that occur in our environment, especially in our childhood, that could make us get into mental disorders. There are social factors. There are psychological factors. With the biological factors, we look at chemical imbalances in the brain. There are several chemicals in our brain that contribute to how we function. As I'm speaking now, there's a chemical that is helping me do that. As I'm watching, as we are hearing, as you experience emotions, as you feel rewarded, all those are determined by certain chemicals called neurotransmitters. These neurotransmitters, like serotonin, are implicated in your mood. They are implicated in how you feel motivated and so on. So when there are imbalances in these chemicals, it could lead to mental disorders. Genetics play a role. That's what has been found in research. Brain injury, chronic illnesses, and some medications as well. Sometimes when people experience abuses in childhood, trauma, violence, emotional neglect, all these can contribute to mental illness. Poor self-esteem, negative thinking. I'm nobody. I cannot function here. I cannot function there. Every time belittling yourself. And sometimes family conflicts at the social level, poverty. Sometimes when people are so, they hardly find any problem with even where they, they live, whether they are in very deplorable conditions or not. And all these are part of our mental health. Unemployment, poor housing, infertility issues. So as women, you know, or you have had, or you have experienced issues of infertility, where you can't do anything because you are struggling to have a child. And the comments from your neighbors, comments from your family, from church members can send you into depression, for example. So these are some of the factors that could risk uh, you. But the good news is that mental health problems can be treated. If you feel very sad, stressed or worried, it might help if you talk to someone. So I was very happy when uh, Madame was talking about some of these things. 
that you don't keep things to yourself. Talk to someone about how you're feeling, someone you trust, and then you'll be fine. So good levels of mental health can lead to improved learning, improved academic achievement, improved productivity, reduced absence from work. You will not call in, I'm sick, I'm sick, because you are well mentally. Reductions in risk taking, like taking alcohol, smoking. Sometimes we think as, as Adventists, oh, these do not relate to us, but they do. We are human beings. People can use alcohol or some other things to cope. But when you have good mental health, you wouldn't go into such. Improved physical health, if your mental health is good, your physical health is good. A healthy mind signifies a healthy body and reduced mortality. Because sometimes you feel so down, you feel so depressed, it could sink you into having suicidal ideations. And sometimes it ends in suicide. So when you have good mental health, it increases your community involvement. We talked about having mental health a program and you are eager to come and listen. You want to be part of it. You want to be part of activities going on in the church, in your community, at your workplace. So why should women's mental health be any different from all that we have spoken about? Why should it be different? Women's mental health should be different because women the burden of mental disorders such as depression and anxiety fall disproportionately on women of childbearing and childbearing age. Women experience these more than men. When going to the literature, you find that women are two times more likely to attempt suicide than men. more likely than men to experience depression, anxiety, eating disorders, and so on. So that's why it's important that we talk about women because the way women experience mental illness is different and the burden is so much and the prevalence is high. There are several factors that predispose women in experiencing these conditions. Hormonal changes during their menstruation periods, pregnancy, menopause can impact a woman's mental well-being. Societal expectations, so much expectations on women. Get married, have children, all that. Who tells men to get married and have children? But women are expected to at some point in life. When you get that, don't get married, everybody is asking you. When you don't have a child, everybody is asking you. And even when you have one child, when are you going to get another? So all the time, these expectations are there. So much gender discrimination all over. You're a woman, you can't talk, you can't do this. Men are doing it, so keep quiet, and so on. Work-life balance in today's world, where you have to combine work with taking care of your kids, relationship issues, and the stress of caregiving itself are things that make women experience mental illness more than men. So we are going to look at depression. We have looked at the generality of mental illness. We are going to look at some specific. And the first one we'll talk about is depression. So if you look on the screen, there's somebody on the screen. Can you unmute and then I would ask somebody what they see on the screen, is it possible? Um, I think they can use the chat room to respond. Okay. All right. So what do we see on the screen? 
What do you see on the screen? What do you see? We see a woman with a uh, emotional stress. Mm. That's what you see. Mm. And it's another one. I see a woman that is bent with his hair covered with his hand holding his head, her head. Mm -hmm. All right. So everybody is seeing somebody who is sort of stressed, her head bent down and all. So what you see on this screen now, I can say is the summary of depression. Down, sad, Feels like the whole world is very dark for you, you see? And this is depression. This is depression. We have several types, but I'm going to take you through them, just um, a few of them. Um, major depression, persistent depressive disorder, depression that can be with you. For over two years, you continue to experience the symptoms. Short, short breaks in between, but you would continue to have it. It's chronic premenstrual dysphoric disorder. That's a, a higher version of what we know as premenstrual syndrome. You know, any of you has heard about that, where uh, ladies in adolescent period, I mean, when they start their menstruation, start experiencing um, some symptoms of sadness, bloating, and so on. But it goes a bit higher than that. And then postpartum depression, and we'll look at bipolar as well. So depression is just more than just feeling sad. It brings intense feelings of hopelessness, despair to a point you cannot take part in normal everyday activities. So when we say you are depressed, it's not like, you feel sad today and then you are depressed. No, it could go on for days, for weeks. They can be strong enough that you cannot work. You cannot cope. Studies have shown between 10 to 20% of young people can also suffer from depression. So approximately 208 in the world have depression. 4% among men and 6% among women. And globally, more than 10% of pregnant women and women who have just given birth experience depression. So you see that depression can affect anyone. Anyone. So if you look at my graph on the screen, you see that if you look at, look at the key here, this, the the dashes you see here are that for the female. Look at this. Continues throughout. And even when the woman is about 50 onwards, it continues. If you look at that of the males, this is what happens. So you see that it's important we talk about depression in women because they go through a lot with it. And it costs the global economy $1.5 trillion each year in lost productivity. More than 75% of people in low and middle income countries receive no treatment and it can lead to suicide. Like I said, over 700,000 people die due to suicide every year. And so because of the nature of depression, in 2017, the World Health Organization made the World Health Day the theme, depression, let's talk. The depression is very important. It's one key health condition, that the uh, mental health condition that we, we cannot skip it. We need to continue educating ourselves on it and how to prevent it and how to, when we get it, how to manage it. Most of the common symptoms are persistent feelings of sadness, emptiness, inability to enjoy things, sleeping too much or too little, fatigue, trouble concentration, and feeling worthless, and thoughts of dying. 
thoughts of dying. Thoughts of dying. So during our menstrual cycle, that changes in our hormones, infertility, pregnancy, estrogen, low levels of estrogen related to depression and suicide, progesterone, low levels of it. In men, testosterone and prolactin, high levels of prolactin during lactation can also um, predispose us to depression. I talked about premenstrual dysphoric disorder, and this affects about 80% of women of childbearing age. So here, it is more severe, like I said, than the PMA. Uh, they share symptoms like mood swings, depressed moods, anxiety, tension, headaches, breast tenderness. But the most likely cause are uh, hormonal changes. Hormonal changes. Hormonal, but it takes a greater toll on women's lives, work, and relationships. Sometimes when people go through, they are told that oh, when you get pregnant, all these things will be over. No. Pregnancy is not protective against mental disorders. When you get pregnant, it doesn't mean you cannot get mental illness. You can get it. And studies have shown that rates of major depression during pregnancy is about 10 to 15%. And anxiety disorders may be higher because there's so much uncertainty that surrounds pregnancy. What is going to happen? Am I going to, out? Am I going to go through CS? Am I going to go through normal delivery? And so on. So if you look at the woman on the screen, it's to say, I'm as though everything is fine. I'm terrified of what lies ahead. So women who have just delivered could go through baby blues. That's, most women go through baby blues for the first two, three days. You really don't know, especially if you're a first time mother, what's going on with you. You're a new mother. What are your responsibilities and so on. But if it's a seat more than a week, two weeks, three weeks, going to a year. No, it is not blues. It is postpartum depression. And it can even get into postpartum psychosis. And these are serious for most women who go through this. This occurs in about 10 to 15% women after delivery, typically in the first six weeks after delivery. And it persists for months to a year. So this is what we had from one woman. It said it was a devastating, it was devastating to my whole family. I'd gone through numerous attempts to have a baby. And when I did finally have this perfect, beautiful, it's all but destroyed me. Couldn't hold the baby. I couldn't do anything for the baby. I couldn't look at the baby. Every time I got near the baby, even the smell of the diapers, I would, my knees would get weak. I would, I would just cry all day long. And I thought I made the worst of life. This is the burden of the disease called postpartum depression. Resentment towards the baby, inability to even adjust to the motherhood role. And may reduce interactions between the mother and the child and delays even the cognitive development of the child. Because if the mother who likely or is the primary caregiver of the child would take the child through his or her developmental milestones. But if the mother is not available, what happens? Delayed motor skills. And sometimes if it even doubles the risk of marital. During the middle aged period, from 40, 41, 42 to 50, there's a higher risk of developing clinical depression. From the perimenopause to the menopausal period. And so overall, depression rates increase up to 16 times in 42 to 52 year old women. And usually there's a decline the hypothalamic pituitary 
gonadal axis function. This particular HP gene is responsible for regulating reproductive activities, releasing of your ovarian hormones. And then during this period, there's entire changes in your central nervous system up to about five years before you start experiencing the hot flashes and the amenorrhea. So during this period too, women don't take it easy at all. And um, one or two main symptoms that are very common with depression during the perimenopause and menopause period is what we call paranoid thinking, always suspecting people, thinking that something is happening, something is causing this irritability, hostility, and all the other that they may be experiencing, like what happens in other forms of depression. Decreased no, sex Hello. Hello, we are hearing you. Can we mute, please? Everybody is talking. <laughs> okay. So suicidal behavior is also very common at this stage, perimenopause and menopause periods, with very low estrogen levels. A survey of 2,000 women ages between four in the UK found that nine in 10 women going through the menopausal transition experience mental health problems. And one in 10 experienced thoughts of suicide. More than a third of them said they hadn't sought help for their symptoms. And that is serious. During the COVID period, there was a lady, I mean, there was a BBC story on a lady who is called Linda Salmon, 56 years, who died by suicide after her anxiety worsened during the pandemic. She said, I stopped answering the phone. I wouldn't even open the post because in my head, I thought every letter was going to contain bad news, she said. She would frequently wake in the middle of the night with panic attacks, but was too terrified to go to the doctor because she thought she was going mad. A husband who had been with her for more than 40 years came to believe that menopause was a big contribution to a mental health and that's severe anxiety related. So you see what happens even when menstruation stops or about to stop. This is what this lady went through and took her life. <clears throat> Another aspect of depression that has also, for example, in this part of our world, it's becoming very common is bipolar. On the screen, you see there is some sunlight and there is some darkness. This is the two poles, bipolar, mania, and depression. This affects about 60 million people globally. And the person alternates between hopelessness and an overexcited state. You know, the person gets into a state of mania elation and during the period of elation they go through what we call the highs movement restlessness high sex drive and this is, has become a common condition for example in ghana amongst young adults as well more impulsive making unrealistic plans becoming more impulsive and during the loss, the sadness is huge. Insomnia, thoughts of suicide, uncontrollable crying, changes in appetite, and trouble making decisions. That is another condition. That is also a mood problem, bipolar. So if you see this on the screen, this is how bipolar presents itself. It's like a roller coaster. It takes you up and it brings you down. So somebody said, like a poem, my emotions are rickety, roller costed and flawed. It's hard to control them. Sometimes because they are up, they are down, I smile, I frown. Weathering writes, even 
upside down until I'm safely, sanely back on the ground. Some mm. normal periods could be in between this, and that's what she's talking about. So that is another condition I wanted to tell you about. And when you have these conditions, they can affect your work, your school, your use of drugs. Sometimes people resort to caffeine, coffee, and so on. Social withdrawal, you may not be able to interact well with people. You may have even have problems and may cause death, death as well. Some of the risk factors and treatment of depression before we go briefly into anxiety, family history, genetics, point studies have shown that people who are first degree relatives and twins, twins that is identical twins, have a higher risk of experiencing depression, deficiencies in hormones like um, serotonin, dopamine, one loss of the job, some conditions like when you all wouldn't be easy for you. So definitely you may go into uh, gender-based violence, caregiving responsibility, lack of support generally, and negative perception of yourself that you don't value yourself, you are nobody. That is one thing that is killing a lot of women. Lack of self-confidence, negative perceptions of their thoughts, but contributes to this. But interestingly, or fortunately, there are medications for treating depression. We also have psychotherapy, cognitive therapy, and other therapies that are helpful. In men, sometimes marriage could help when a man is depressed, some studies have shown that. And well-connected social networks, that's what we want to say, actually. Employment and religiosity in our own spirituality is helpful. So that is why I was happy when Madame kept mentioning some Bible uh, quotations to guide us. When we are down, we should seek the Lord in prayer. Suddenly we will look at anxiety, but we will get to a point, we'll do a little exercise before I'll give you some self-care strategies. If you have feelings of uneasiness, worry, fear, so on the screen you see Mr. Worry, that is anxiety. Always in a mode of worrying, thinking of the next minute, the next moment, the next day, when it hasn't come. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So every time you are on, anxiety can actually sharpen your focus, prepare you for the what ifs, especially when you are going for a job interview or you're going to have a program, something, you need to stay focused. So anxiety will guide you, but when it becomes too much, it mobilizes you. You cannot even function. You can get a mental blockade, even when you go, you, you go to the, the job interview. So anxiety helps though. But it can be negative as well. That is when it will lead to an anxiety disorder. It can paralyze you, it can sap your energy, hinder healthy sleep, makes you feel out of control, damage your relationships, and it can become a serious mental health disorder, mm -hmm. anxiety. So we just say it with our mouth, oh, anxiety, anxiety. Anxiety is a serious condition. Even treating it is more difficult than depression. Mm -hmm. Common symptoms are palpitation, when you start breathing very fast, sweating, trembling, shaking, shortness of breath, feeling like you're choking, something is in your throat, chest pain, discomfort, nausea, stomach upset, hot and cold flashes, you don't feel hot, you don't feel cold, you don't know what to do. Tight and painful chest, it's like your, your chest is tightening up. That is anxiety disorders. That's how they present themselves. And there are several types of this. We have specific phobias. Who in this room is afraid of a spider? He's afraid of a spider or a snake. 
or you see a snake on the television and you quickly turn or change the channel. So we have specific phobias, panic disorders, social phobias, generalized anxiety. There are several of them, but we'll just take a look at bits and pieces of these and then we'll give time for questions. So specifically, people get excessive fear of this, that they cannot breathe when they see it. Fear of flying. So one time I had a client who couldn't sit in an airplane because he was afraid of flying. He had avoided this for a very long time at his workplace. And now he couldn't avoid it because he had to go. And he called me, Dr. Mabel, you can't avoid this. What should I do? So even he cannot pass the vicinity of the airport because he gets distressed. So I had to give him step-by-step -step points as to what he should do along the way, way up to when he gets there, he goes and then coming back, it was terrible. That is what anxiety disorders can do. Some people experience phobias when they have to stand in front of people. So they try to avoid the social situations like standing in front of people to talk in church, at programs, and they feel that they'll make mistakes. They'll humiliate themselves. So they start talking to themselves. Am I sure I'm not going to say something that people would laugh at me? And so on. Fear of negative evaluation, scrutiny. And this makes them go through anxiety a lot. And then there are others who experience what we call panic, panic attacks, sudden, intense episode of apprehension, terror feeling of impending doom. It's like something is going to happen to you. Sometimes you are left in your home or at work, or you find yourself at a place and you feel like you are going to die. Something is going to capture you. So intense fear, total discomfort, feeling of being overwhelmed. Usually, right. panic attacks like this. Look at this image. You see, it's as if something is going to capture him. That is when you feel those attacks. It's intense. And it peaks within 10 minutes. Like you are losing it and you are dying. And with the generalized anxiety disorder, it's like you, you are a constant warrior. You are a constant warrior. Chronic, excessive, generalized, uncontrolled. Worry. You worry about worry. There's worry, but you worry about worry. You see, when they ask oh, you or when you are asked, yeah. why are you worried? When yeah. you are asked, okay. what is wrong with you? You don't know. Oh, Common worries are health, financial hassles. And sometimes you tell people, you've always been like this. This is how I've always been. It is not funny to always be like that. It is not interesting to always be like that. There's a problem that needs to be fixed. That needs to be fixed. So whilst anxiety, panic, Depression and all that, especially with anxiety, are unpleasant. They are necessary for survival and protection. If you don't have anxiety, anything could just happen to you and you die because you don't have any alarm systems that would alert you. So if this bear is coming, you just wait for the bear to catch you and eat you up. But the issue is that Nothing diminishes anxiety faster than action. We need to take action. There are medications for this. And then there's psychotherapy. Relaxation, there are several relaxation therapies. Fortunately, we have a lot online. And when you see your therapist too, they can take you through a lot. 
breathing exercises. We can do one now. You're taking a deep breath. Let's try it. Breathe in through your nose and out through your mouth. So let's do it. Breathe in, hold, hold, and then out. You can do this anywhere you find yourself. If you feel a little tensed, do it. Breathe in, out. And other methods of restructuring your mind, restructuring your mind. So I'm going to give you a little exercise to do now before we go on to um, something else. Let me, let me get this first. So how do we restructure our thoughts? How do we restructure our thoughts? You need to challenge your thoughts. For you to prevent and avoid depression, anxiety, you can help yourself with these. Put your thoughts on a witness stand. You see a witness stand? This is a witness stand. What's the evidence that this thought is true? What's the evidence that I'm inefficient? Because that's what your mind is, will be telling you. This job you've been given, can you do it? Are you sure? I don't think you can do it. This is too high for you. What's the evidence? Because you've been able to do the other one. You were able to deliver. What shows you cannot do this one? What would I tell a friend who had this book? If a friend comes to you and had the same thought, what would you tell him or her? Is there another way of looking at the situation? Or how might I look at this situation if I didn't have depression or anxiety? If I didn't have these, how might I look at this situation? Have you asked yourself this? And if you're able to put these thoughts on the witness stand, do you see? and you'll be surprised how quickly they crumble. In the process, you'll be able to develop a more balanced perspective to help relieve your depression and anxiety. We do this all the time and it's helpful. You see that you're able to restructure your thoughts. You're able to replace your irrational thoughts with more rational ones. Life is all about balance. Life is all about balance. You cannot have it all as perfect you can create a balance for yourself. So how do people think positively when bad things happen to them? Somebody is asking, I know, at this point, I'm struggling. You want me to think positive. How would I do that? Be hopeful. That is what you can do. Be hopeful. Hopefulness. Be thankful. Count your blessings and name them one by one and have a growth mindset. Positive thinking helps us to be better problem solvers. Have a growth mindset. It is not lost or all is not lost. Anytime something happens, have the belief that something bright could come out of that situation. And like Madame outlined for us during her speech, you should reach out and stay connected. Get social support. We are fortunate. We have an Adventist church that helps us with social gatherings a lot. So do things that make you feel good. What makes you feel good? You write it very soon for me. What makes you feel good? Is it by going on a walk? Is it by going to the mall? What makes you feel good? eating a well-balanced diet and eliminate the use of alcohol, caffeine, drugs, and get moving, exercise is key. Because when you exercise, it releases happy chemicals, chemicals called endorphins that helps you to feel good. When you exercise, you don't feel down, you feel good all the time. And get a do daily dose of sunlight. Don't be indoors all the time. I remember I used to tell the woman I work with that she's always indoors. I told her that when you get out there, sit at the gate, get some sunlight, get some vitamin D, you see, you'll feel better. It boosts your serotonin levels and improve your mood and establish a regular sleep pattern. 
what time do you sleep? Are you on the internet most of the time? Even if it's 12 p.m., you are still up watching videos here and there, doing WhatsApp, Facebook, and so on. These are not helpful. So get rid of worry. Worry is evidence of an ill-controlled brain. It is merely a stupid waste of time in unpleasantness. It elevates your stress hormones. So take a decision to stop worrying today. Take a decision to stop worrying today. So why do we have this in the scriptures? Because the Bible knows that we will. That is why it tells us to be anxious for nothing. In Philippians 4, 6. If you have thoughts of suicide, remember you are not alone. And that there are many people who have gone through what you are experiencing now. Talk to someone. Talk to a psychologist or a counselor. Talk to your pastor. Join a support group. Talk to people because you need to hold on and the pain will end soon. The pain will end soon. So you need to hold on. So I want you to write something for me. Take pieces of papers on your own. Write something for me. I'm going to show you some statements and you continue with your own words for me. This is going to help you explore your thoughts and your feelings, as well as creating a more positive outlook on your thoughts. So just like the man has taken the part, take your part, take a piece of paper. See, just be yourself. Let people see the real imperfect flawed, quirky, weird, beautiful, magical person that you are. I like who I am because, can somebody give me an answer? I like who I am because, I like who I am because, mm -hmm. because, because I'm a child of God. Because you're a child of God. I am good at, what are you good at? I'm good at what? Can somebody tell me one? Singing. I'm good at singing. So you know you are good at something. So what would take you down? Nothing should take you down. I feel good about my... Wow. I really admire myself for, it made me feel my, great when- Myself. Good. You, see, you, have, you keep a journal and you have these. You write them, you tell them to yourself. Nothing whatsoever in terms of depression or anxiety could come into your, your books. So God wants us to feel well too like we were told this evening by our mother. Just as counselors and psychologists wants us to feel good and feel well, God too, he created us. And so when you look at first Peter 5, 7, he says we should cast all our cares and anxieties upon him. He cares for us. Jeremiah 29, 11 says what? Oh, I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. Do you remember the life of David? I know we all remember the life of David. You remember what he went through with Saul, what he went through? He said, but David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. So we are not alone. If you are going through any kind of anxiety, Depression, you are not alone. David went through it. You remember Elijah? He said, all the people are dead. No more prophets. I'm the only one left. It is enough now, oh Lord, take away my life. For I'm no better than my father's. 
And he lay down and slept under a broom tree. And behold, an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. That was Elijah. What about our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? Do you remember him? He, he was human and divine. When he was about to die, he went through depression. He went through anxiety. He said, if it is your will, let this cup pass me. He cried in Gethsemane. So if you are crying today, it is no sin to cry. You can cry. But know that Jesus cried too. And he'll see you through. There are so many angels that he has sent to take care of you. So you are not alone. Whatever you are going through, you are not alone. That is what you should always remember. So if you know someone or you yourself, you are experiencing symptoms of depression, you're experiencing symptoms of anxiety, seek help. Don't wait. Seek help. Take action now. Take action now so that you feel better. What would I give you to take away? What would I give you to take away? I want to give you a few points to take away. And when you are home, be going through it. Every time, remember to get active. Remember to get active. A simple walk around your neighborhood would lift your mood. Interesting. Make a daily schedule. Create routine. Bring structure to your life. Don't live haphazardly. When you live haphazardly, your life is not structured. So you, can, you, you, you get so confused. All the time when you wake up, try to write the things you want to do. Follow it and it gives you a sense of accomplishment. This is what I have been able to do today. Set small goals. Today, I can do two things. Don't write 10 things you cannot do. And when the day ends and you haven't done them, you feel anxious. No. Volunteer. Help other people. As you help other people, you feel good about yourself. You boost your own spirits. The one thing that I always tell my clients to do is to make a gratitude log. Have a gratitude log. Write down one to two things every day that you are grateful for in your life. Lord, I'm grateful for my life today. Lord, I'm grateful for my health today. And as you do that, you lift your mood. But in all these two, you have to consider therapy. Be a professional. Seek support. Because we are here to help you. That is what we are trained for. So it's okay to ask for help. It's okay. Not bad. It is not shameful. When things are not right with you, seek for help. Seek for help. Celebrate your life now. Don't postpone it. Don't save it for a later date. Today is the day you need to celebrate your thoughts. Be happy, like the lady on the screen, that you have life that you could partake in this program, that you know that God is with you no matter how difficult the situation is. I thank you for your attention and God bless us all. Thank you, Doc, for the message. I think we will have a, a Q and A session and then see how it goes from there. So please, um, if you want to ask any questions, kindly raise your hand. Uh, <laughs> kindly raise your hand so that we can acknowledge you for you to ask your question. Question time, please. You can also write it in the chat room. 
I would look at it. Okay. Doc, I want to ask a question. Okay, please go on. You know, when people get to know that they have a problem, either depression or some kind of mental problem, how do they handle gossips? Because sometimes when, you know, because of the stigma that is associated with this uh, type of illness, some people stay away from the public. But life must go on. As you have explained, it is not the end of life. It's not, it's not something that we should be ashamed of. How can one handle the way others treat them negatively because they have this, uh, they're in this kind of mental situation, maybe at school, at their workplace, at church, how do they handle the talking? Yeah. So um, when somebody has, for example, I mean, any kind of mental illness, including depression and anxiety, once they are not on treatment, and they, they, I mean, people start talking about them or whatever, it creates problems for them. But when they go into treatment, they go see a therapist or a counselor, they are guided as to how they should take these, you know, and that is why the support is also key. People around them, their family, their friends, should provide the kind of support for them that will make them feel accepted and not fall to what people are saying. You know, when it comes to stigma and mental illness, it's not going to go away today because we are human and people would continue to discriminate. People will continue to say things negative about people. But once people recognize or realize that there is a problem, they seek help, they know how to, I mean, manage these in terms of not giving their minds to what people say and then focusing on what they can do than the limitations people are talking about. No, it wouldn't happen, especially when the person goes into treatment you know, medication or psychotherapy. Because sometimes when it comes to, for example, depression, schizophrenia and all that, with depression, when it's a major depression, people or uh, patients are usually put on antidepressants to be able to lift their mood. And when their moods are lifted, they are able to deal with issues around them more than when they are down in their, their mood. So once they get help, when they get support from family and friends, they'll be able to handle things very well. Yes. So somebody says that when you talk to a psychologist, yes, the problem shared is a problem solved. You know, once you, even when this person is not a psychologist, once you share it through talking, catharsis, you see that you feel better than keeping it within you. So you may not go about telling everybody, this is the challenge I'm having, but you can get a trusted friend, somebody you trust, and then you can share your problems with, and then you see that you feel relieved. Yes. Thank you. Yes, Madam Jane, please go on. Okay, thank you, Doc, for the lectures. Okay. Actually, sometimes some of us feel that we are okay, mm -hmm. but from all that we have heard tonight, mm -hmm. I can even um, identify mm -hmm. some of these factors. Yeah, I can link myself to them. Yeah. So, and I know that in many of our homes, all of us here can uh, have experienced one thing or the other, and some are even still going through it. And so, mm -hmm. you see, this forum is a pastor's forum. And sometimes mm -hmm. we want to hide under the fact, oh, I'm a shepherdess. If I should let anybody know how, what will people say? Mm -hmm. uh, what will people say? What will my members say if I am like this? And so we mm -hmm. try to hide things and things get out of hand. Mm -hmm. Because recently we experienced uh, many of our, uh, some pastor's wives maybe leaving their husbands, having one mm -hmm. issue or the other. Mm -hmm. Uh, some 
maybe due to infertility issues, but we mm -hmm. don't see these things as depression. We don't see mm -hmm. them as anxiety. We don't see them mm -hmm. as a problem that needs yeah. solving. Yeah. So how can maybe the church? Yeah. I think this needs to go to every church. Yeah. It needs to go to every church. It needs to be in every um, like we have all these uh, women ministries, conventions, men's conventions. Yeah. So if, if people are aware, if a wife is aware, she'll be able to notice when the husband is going through anxiety and call yeah. his attention. Yeah. If, the, if the husband be, will be able to notice when the wife is going through these uh, depressive yeah. uh, things yes. and uh, yeah. call the attention. But when you don't know, it's not mm -hmm. easy to identify Yeah hand on it that this is actually what I am going through. Yeah. Now, yeah. come to think of it, we as shepherdesses, many people are looking up to us, yeah. uh, those living in the personage. Is there really a way that a, a sort of training, we're not psychologists, yes, we didn't go yeah. to, to study it in school, but is there something that can be packaged yeah. and given to them so that they, they can use it and talk to their talk to the women so yeah. that people will become really aware of this because it, uh, the world yeah. is not getting any better things are getting more difficult and then the more difficult things become the more anxious people are also getting yeah. on how to solve yeah. this problem so even yeah. getting some of these slides yeah. and things yeah. like we that will, we would um i'll talk to um your coordinator and then like you said um this is very important uh, it's because as the church, most of us attribute everything to spiritual, spiritual, but there are real issues that are happening in our churches today. So we would think of something, I mean, some training um, for people like you in leadership positions, what you can do for your, for your members, because as you said, most of them or all of them are looking up to you. They get problems, they come to you, you don't seem to know what to do. Sometimes you just pray and fine, prayers are good, but you can also, when you know something, you can refer the person, see this person, talk to this person, and that'll be good. Um, thank you so much, uh, Madam Jane. I don't know you, so that's why I'm calling you Madam Jane. I'm sorry if I need to <laughs> add any other um, protocol. Okay, yes, okay. Jane, Jane is sure. the Associate uh, Director for Education at what? All right, all right. Thank you very much. So um, somebody was asking something in the chat. I want us to look at it. Somebody said that, um, um, let me see. Somebody asked a question on if you, the, 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 the one having the problem, you have already caused, doctor, how can you face the public when you as a victim have caused a lot of distraction in your home and the community? It's in situation like this, how can you help? Yeah. So when somebody usually um, goes through uh, schizophrenia, when they are out of touch with reality, and they, they are not aware of most of the things they do, and you said they've caused a lot of distraction, uh, problems with people here and there in the church, in their home, you, you cannot really blame them. You see, you cannot really blame them. That is why you need to help them get treatment, you see? So you let people know that this is the problem. And the person is not doing it uh, knowingly, the person is aware. But once the person gets treatment, the person will know that, oh, these things that I was doing, it wasn't the best. I don't have to go into this. So I have to stay in my treatment so that I'll be able to function well. So if the person has done something to their home, or wherever in the church, they need to be forgiven because they are not aware. They don't know what they are going through, especially when it comes to schizophrenia. Depression can take you so low, it could even be psycho or psychotic, you know? So um, you need to forgive them, integrate them back into the home, the society, let people know that Mental illness is no respecter of persons. A pastor can get it, a pastor's wife, a deacon, a deaconess. So nobody is out of the equation. Anybody can get it. So remember, 
um, our mother from GC said that when she gave birth, she had postpartum depression. So we are not the only ones. Anybody could get it. But when it happens, what do we do? She sought for help. She got help. She started using exercises, eating well, talking to family and all of that. And she felt better. That is what we should seek to do. And some of the things we have been given this evening as well. And there's another one, another question on, um, I'm trying to get the, the, the chat. Um, really, okay, let me see. I have been through, please let's not skip, okay. Uh, okay. How can I help someone with depression when the person is not ready to listen? So when somebody has depression, maybe you have, you, you haven't diagnosed the person, but you have seen some of the symptoms I've spoken about. You speak to the person, it depends on how close you are, but you get from anywhere and they start saying, hey, you have depression. No, you are not a therapist. So you can talk to whoever is very close to this person. So talk to the person in a way that the person would understand that there is a need to speak to a counselor. Offer to even go with the person. I want to accompany you. Let's see this person. I'm told that when she speaks to you, you you feel better. This is no problem. You will be fine soon. Assure the person and offer to support. Don't leave the person that, oh, the person is not ready to listen. No, it is in that moment that the person needs you a lot. Because the person doesn't understand or doesn't appreciate what is going on. So if you think that, oh, I've been, I've, I've spoken to the person, the person is not listening to me. No, 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 no. Find ways. Sometimes there are other people in their lives who they are likely to listen to. There's somebody they love so much that person can easily convince them to see a therapist. And you can even tell them, I'll go with you. I'll support you in this journey. I'll pray with you. Now there is video conferencing, there's video call, WhatsApp call, whatever. If you are not close to the person, you can do video call. Let's pray together. Let's talk, talk about this. And then the person sees that I have support. I have luck and I'll get better. So many people feel alone because of the stigma. So that is why we keep raising awareness. Mental health awareness is not a one day thing. Every day we continue to do this. And the church should be a safe place to accommodate those with mental disorders. It's true. The church should be a safe haven for whoever, whatever the person is going through, the church should be there to support the person. So I remember in one of our churches, when we realized that one of our members was exhibiting symptoms of schizophrenia and hallucinating, delusions and so on, they got in touch with a psychologist and then they started talking to this person. They started seeking help. The church was the one at the forefront of this, providing, I mean, uh, money for, the hospital uh, care and so on. And the person is feeling better now. So would we lose this member? You wouldn't lose this member to anybody because the church is there to protect this member. Yeah. Any more, please? I think Are we don't okay? have any more questions. All right, thank you very much. I want to do ask a question. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you, Dr. Mabel. Um, All right. Now, we, I'm speaking from the pastor's perspective. Okay. Our wives right. are the ones who are here. Okay. Um, how should we, as pastors, handle our wives when we find that they are in such a situation? How should we help? Okay. So as a pastor, when you find your wife in such a situation, support, support, support. That is key. Talk to your wife about what you have observed and do it in a manner that your wife feels loved 
by what you're saying. Not in a harsh way that nowadays you don't dress well, your hair is unkempt, look at the way you are looking, we are going to church and people will be talking. You don't know what she's going through, why she's not appreciating keeping her, her hair well, why she's not appreciating dressing well like she used to. So you need to sit her down, ask her, talk to her. What is going on with you? Tell me your issues. I'm here for you. Let her know you are here for her. And then nobody would be able to keep things inside when you avail yourself like this. So assure her that you are there for her and that you are ready to listen and go all the way through with her wherever it will take both of you. Once you do that, she'll be willing to share everything with you, and then you can provide all the support she needs. I mean, during problems with fertility, during problems with perimenopause, menopause, when she's experiencing hot flashes, you know, so many things. Problems with concentration, sometimes she'll serve you food and she'll forget the spoon, she'll forget the knife, she'll forget the fork. So is it that every day now you forget to bring cutlery? That's what you say. But ask, try to find out whether she's okay. What is going on with her? You will know that there's something troubling her. And then you will know that it is because of that period. That is why she's going through that. And support her. If she forgets to provide you cutlery, go and get the cutlery yourself. Support her at home. Support her at church. And when you do that, to feel better. And if she needs help externally, then be prepared to go with her. That's what you can do as a pastor. Because you remember that church members are also looking up to her. So she also needs to be in good shape to be able to support them. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jill. Okay, thank you, Doc, for the Thank you, sir. Are we going to the next one? Or... That's it? Yes, we are done. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, we want to we want to ask if anyone has any more questions to ask. We have a few minutes more before it's nine o'clock. Jane, your hand is up. Is it a new hand or is uh, the old one? It's not the old one, it's the new hand. Okay, let's hear you. Oh, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's not really a question. It's um, okay. it's a little okay. bit related to what Pastor just asked on how okay. to okay. help if a, um, a spouse has uh, met uh, some anxiety issues. So I just wanted to share this. Oh, I can't really remember it exactly because it's been some time I saw it. It's a group of people, a video that was posted on WhatsApp in one of my uh, groups. So it's about a lady, she came out, she was actually talking about mental issues because she has been a victim of it and how she was able to overcome it because of this support issue you are talking about. So in her case, in, um, her friends knew, the husband knew, her children knew, and everybody around her was um, kind of uh, informed on what to do. So her children knew what their most problem was so that when she's at home, if anything happens, they will come around and mommy, what is it? What do you need? They know her drugs. They are, they, they are able to take care of her. And she is an educated woman. She's a professional in her work. And so they now formed a group of uh, women who have similar issues and they are able to uh, meet together. They are able to chat. They are able to discuss their issues. And so she came out about it she wasn't ashamed of it because she had the support of her family she had the support of her husband she had the support of her 
of her children. So in such situations, we like somebody said here, yeah, we should not die in silence and uh, we should not stigmatize people who have it. So because she was taking her drug, she was able to live a normal life. She goes to work, she has her children, she has her family that she's taking care of. So people, when they are, when it starts, when they have that attack, they normally don't know what they are doing. So people should not use it. If we're where people are talking about people who have mental issues, we are now in a better position to defend those people and to cancel others because nobody knows sorrow how it will happen. Thank you. There are other people. Uh, okay, sorry. Who well, are Mercy? Mercy, your hand is up. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Thank you so much, ma'am, for your presentation. Well, You've really enlightened us today. Okay. Um, my question is, I want to know whether there is a difference between the anxiety and um, depression. Yes. The difference is that depression is a mood disorder. It deals okay. with your mood. And anxiety is about you feeling uneasy, worrying, you know. So they are, a, you know, a bit related. Usually when people are depressed, they could get anxious too. So, um, but depression, more of it is a mood problem. It's a mood problem. And so you feel very sad. You lack concentration. You feel wetless and so on. But anxiety, more of it has to do with you feeling uneasy. I mean, having your Patients here and there, you, you you feel like something is going to happen to you. Like I was telling you, you would really, really need this person who feels something is going to happen to them to change or to, I mean, change the, those irrational thoughts they are having. And it's, it's not easy, you know. So all of it, we need to try very hard if it's not just that, like I said, there are some genetic predispositions, but even with that, there are environmental triggers. So when we don't expose ourselves to lots of stress, we don't get stressed too much, we need to manage life so that we don't get to the levels of experiencing these conditions. Yeah. Thank you so much. Okay. So, uh, Mr. Quenin, Kwame Quenin. Okay, thank you very much, Doc. We are okay. so delighted and delighted to hear from you. Powerful lessons have yeah. been given to us. So we express our deep appreciation to you. Right. However, I want to know how you can provide a gratitude log. How do you do it? Okay. So I'll, I'll send an example to um, uh, the Madam uh, Odonko and she'll share with you like every day there are things that are listed, and then you 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 write them in terms. Of, so it's like a diary. What you did in the day, how you were able to come out of it, how grateful you are, and so on. And that has been found to be very positive in terms of, I mean, aiding your your mental well being. So uh, it's not like you you every day everything is so bad, but even within the day or during the day where things are, but you can still find something that happened that was good for you. So I'll share a copy and then you can you can try your hands on it. And there's an interesting comment here. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's a question. He <laughs> said, I'm currently living with my 83-year-old mother-in-law and she doesn't appreciate anything I do for her. Sometimes when you save her, you serve her food, to say I want to poison her, what do I do? You see, old age comes with lots of mental health issues. Comes along with dementia, you know, and the, the commonest one is uh, Alzheimer's, you know. So people have problems with memory and so on. So when it comes to dementia and all that during old age, who lose their cognitive resources. So, um, sometimes they are unable to 
appreciate what goes on around them. So you just have to be patient with them, know the age in which they are. There is treatment though. If you can take her to the hospital, they can assess her, get to know what's really going on with her in the brain, and they can give her treatment. Okay? So if you want to help her, you can help her. You can put her on some medications. She can be taught on how to do certain things. And very soon, she'll start appreciating people around her. You see? So you can help her. When she goes, they would assess her and they'll see what is really going on in the brain. Sometimes there are little, little strokes that occur in the brain as well that we don't know. They are happening. You know, mm -hmm. they haven't gotten to a threshold that they'll kick the person down. So they are happening and then they are disrupting the person's uh, functioning. So you can take her for a checkup and then they can see, they can see what they, they can do for her. All right. Thank you very much. Okay, guys, so another question. I think two more questions here. How can a mother of twins handle depression yeah. when a family is far from her and she have just a husband? Yeah. Yeah, so how can she get this risk? Because it's actually difficult. It's difficult. Like I would say, even, I mean, raising children, I mean, being a mother is difficult. And then if you have fallen into depression, it would be more difficult. But that is why your husband is there. And your husband should seek the support of the friends, the network he has, the church, you know, around. You shouldn't keep it to yourselves because you need help and seek help with a therapist. And that would be helpful because if your family is far off or far away, they can not do much. They may contact you through video calling and so on, but your husband can go a bit further with also getting support from the networks you have built. That's why it's important to build networks. It's very important. You cannot be a human being and then you want to isolate yourself all the time. When you do that, then you have a mental health challenge. You see, so most of the time you need to build relationships, build networks, so that when anything is happening, you have people to fall on. But if you are alone, you cannot be alone. If you want to be alone, then you have a mental health issue that needs to be addressed. Yes. All right. Thank All right, you. I think we are done. So thank you so much. Thank you, we are very grateful. Thank you, my shepherdesses from various unions, the 22 countries of WAD. We are so grateful. You know, we thank you for attending the program. I know some of you had the um, internet challenges. Some people are sending messages on WhatsApp. We can't connect. The internet is bad. But we thank God for those who have been able to get on. And um, we want to thank you so much, Dr. Mabel Tibwedi. We don't say that, but we are really, really grateful. It's been a very timely lesson. And we hope that even in the future, when we call on you, you'll be available to, um, to us. We want to also thank the interpreters of the various uh, languages, French, Portuguese, and Spanish. God bless you so much for, you know, taking your house time to do this for us. We want to say a very big thank you to Ancien Diodoni. It's on his platform that we are sailing on this program. So Ancien, merci beaucoup. Dieu te bénisse beaucoup, beaucoup, beaucoup. Then we want to thank our mommy from the GC. Mom, canals. Thank you so much for being with us, giving us the, the devotion and being us. Ladies, God bless you so much. Give you strength in your various, um, you know, churches, and the pastors who have come on board with us. We are so glad you came. Thank you for joining. Thank you for being there for us. We want to end the program now.
us a word and then give us a benediction. Thank you very much, Mrs. Donko. It's very impressive program and great lessons have been learned. So we want especially uh, many participants, more than 170 people. So it's a very enriching program. We need it, we need it. And Doc Mabel, we are so grateful for your ministry. Thank you very much. Mama Aras, Mrs. Kana, we are very, very grateful for your powerful devotion and we greet our colleagues, our leaders in GC. Thank you so much. Shall we bow for prayer? Mighty, for, mighty God, we want to thank you so much for great lessons that you have given to us today. We bless your name that always you want us to have good health, the direction, and then this wonderful presentation that we have enjoyed and studied together. I want to thank you for the great ministry of Dr. Mabel Otibwedi. We bless you for her life. Thank you so much for using her to touch our whole being so we can all the time have great health to contribute and expand the citizens of the kingdom. Tonight, continue to minister your grace on us. You know what is coming to us. Have challenges here and there. You are our healer. Thank you that always you want us to abide in you. The promises are so edifying that you are with us. You have a hopeful future for us that you will never leave us, that we shouldn't worry. You are with us. So thank you for numerous ways that you want us to grow in health so that we can contribute to the expansion of your kingdom. Therefore, Lord, bless all our participants today. And again, we lift your main servant, Dr. Mrs. Otibwedi, to your care and keeping. We want to thank you for the ministry of Aras. She has said a lot, even what she went through has been a great lesson to us. So as we go from one another, we believe your presence will go with us. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his mighty countenance upon each and every one of us. In the name of Jesus Amen. 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 Thank you, Pastor. Amen. Thank you so much for joining. Amen. Have a good night. May the Lord Amen. grant us the beauty of Amen. tomorrow morning. Bye, Mom. Amen. Thank you so Amen. much. Amen.